Welcome back to the program. Journalists and white activists in Togo have condemned an alleged violation of press freedom in the country. This comes after the country's media watchdog shut down a private television station and radio station, accusing them of broadcasting without a license. But the owners of the stations deny the allegations, saying the closure is politically motivated. Hundreds of journalists and civil society members came together in Togo's capital, Lome, on Tuesday to protest the closure of two media bodies, television station LCF and Radio City FM. They accused the country's main broadcast media regulatory body, the High Authority for Audiovisual and Communication, of trying to muzzle the press in a country where the media has often had a fraught relationship with the authorities and press freedom has been under considerable restrictions in recent years. Since the 1990s, the people of Togo are fought in order to gain a number of rights in this country. But today, we have noticed that there are people with bad intentions who want to question all that has been gained through a democratic process. So, the purpose of this protest is to be able to put an end to all those issues that want to question press freedom. Hack says the closure came following findings that the two media houses were illegally broadcasting without proper licenses since 2007, a claim that editors of both houses reject. They say they have complied with the law and hack regulations. Some critics claim the closures are politically motivated after the owners of the two media entities allegedly had a fallout with Togolese authorities. But Hack maintains that they are working within their mandate to regulate the press in Togo. In its mandate to conduct the evaluation of media houses in Togo, the I Authority for Audiovisual and Communication has come to realize that the television channel LCF and Radio City FM, who have been broadcasting since 2007, had not obtained any authorization to do so by the Broadcasting Authority. The hack has five members chosen by the National Assembly and four by the President. Foreign Yasinbe's government has been at odds with the media and since he was declared the winner in presidential elections in March 2010, taking a second term in office. He took over after 38 years of dictatorship under his father in Yasinbe Yadema. Journalists in Togo often accuse the authorities of trying to clamp down on any report that are critical of President Yasinbe's administration. Many journalists say they continue to face intimidation and harassment and violent confrontations between police and journalists are common. Reporters Without Borders ranks Togo at the 80th of countries with the most free press. And the World Organization for Animal Health says Cameroon has confirmed a case of the highly contagious H5N8 bird flu virus in the northern parts of the country. The virus was found early in January in exotic peacocks and villages, chickens and ducks. The H5N8 strain, which is deadly for poultry but has not been found in humans, has spread across Europe, the Middle East and Africa since late last year, leading to the slaughter of millions of poultry and the confinement of flocks indoors. And ahead of the February 24 Oslo Humanitarian Conference on Nigeria and the Lake Chad region, 13 donor countries are conducting assessment tours to Borono State in northeast Nigeria, where millions have been displaced by the Boko Haram insurgency. The UN and other sister agencies have launched a major emergency appeal for increased funding to effectively bridge the gap in the crisis affected areas. Representatives of government of donor countries are all part of the group. With the return of peace to the northeast and locals returning home to pick up the pieces, both government, local and international humanitarian agencies have been a part of the rebuilding process in affected communities in the northeast. Ahead of the February 24 Oslo Humanitarian Conference in Nigeria and the Lake Chad region, representatives of governments of donor countries gather in Borno State to assess communities and find how best to assist. Japanese ambassador to Nigeria confesses that the humanitarian crisis is massive and beyond description. 
He wants the Nigerian government to do more in terms of intervention programs for the affected population. I think uh, we have to uh, very close cooperate to deal with this crisis. We will do our best, but the effort from the international community alone cannot do the work. So the participation of Nigerian government is also a very important factor. Ambassador of Ireland is also among those who have interacted with the affected population as well as the key actors in the Northeast. He believes that military operational successes translate to discovery of more displaced persons. We've met many farmers uh, and many women who are restless to go back but would not go back tomorrow if they had the chance. So it, it is dealing with that and one thing that is very important is to to acknowledge that this takes time and that deadlines are not going to be set because of shortage of funding. We will commit ourselves in Oslo to fully support the process of moving from a humanitarian crisis to a normalization and to recovery. The UN humanitarian agencies are appealing for aid to the tune of $1.05 billion for intervention in the Lake Chad region. Ministers from countries of the region, representatives of UN agencies and civil society would be reached on the proposed budgeted appeal. Egypt's most famous export, the silky soft cotton prized by makers of luxury bedding and clothing, has become so scarce as production has fallen that most supplies sold under its brand name last year were fake. But a surge in local cotton prices ahead of next month's planting season and a crackdown on fake Egyptian cotton worldwide are reviving interest in cultivating the long-neglected crop. Farmers, spinners and exporters say the weakness of the Egyptian pound following its flotation in November and a scandal over the alleged sale of falsely labelled Egyptian cotton have increased demand for the real thing injecting life into a historic industry on its deathbed. Last year, agricultural production of Egypt's high-quality, long-staple cotton hit a more than 100-year low. In a bid to save its historic crop, Egypt in 2016 banned all but the highest quality cotton seed, dramatically shrinking the area under cultivation but restoring quality. The U.S. Department of Agriculture estimates that in 2016 to 2017, Egypt will produce 160,000 bales, half of the previous year's crop. Spinners and exporters say some foreign suppliers have mixed lower-grade lint into yarns and fabrics, passing them off as Egyptian cotton because of the global low stocks. The Cotton Egypt Association, which provides an official logo to suppliers of 100% Egyptian cotton, estimates that about 90% of global supplies of Egyptian cotton last year were fake. And that's it on today's program. Thank you so much for watching. I am BC Adebayo.